We're all painfully aware that Disney and Pixar are the same thing, yet Disney still feels the need to jerk itself off for 40 seconds before the movie starts. Spotlight on adventure! Movie steals the expositional documentary inside the actual movie motif from Citizen Kane. Undiscovered by science! Science doesn't make discoveries, people do. Who would dare set foot on this inhospitable summit? Charles Muntz! And also these two assholes and whoever's filming this newsreel. This lighter than aircraft was designed by Muntz himself and is longer than 22 Prohibition paddy wagons placed end to end. As opposed to the normal everyday paddy wagon, which was somehow lesser capacity and had no chance in hell of telling us what era this movie is set in. Canine Comfort, complete with doggy bath and mechanical canine walker. These look more like dog torture devices than contraptions conceived for canine comfort. Jiminy Cricket, to the locals consider Muntz the bee's knees. And how? It sounds like Pixar's turn of the century idiom generator just malfunctioned. I mean, holy mackerel, how many caca? phrases are these bums gonna throw at me? The National Explorer Society accuses Muntz of fabricating the skeleton. Why? Because this guy doesn't know how to use a compass? Or this guy doesn't know how bones work? Or possibly because it's convenient to the plot? Adventure in Carl conveniently overhears Ellie say this, just as he walks past the dilapidated house, prompting him to find out who said it. If Ellie just saw the same screening of Muntz's documentary, how was she able to find this abandoned house and rig it up to play Explorer before Carl had enough time to walk past it and catch her in the middle of her narrative? What's wrong? Can't you talk? Nope, and he won't be able to for 60 years. Carl's balloon, that Ellie now inexplicably possesses, still has enough helium in it to lift a large stick just high enough into the air to go into Carl's room, and by some kind of dog-talking level witchcraft, is able to change directions as soon as it reaches Carl's bedroom window. Cross it! Cross your heart! Behind every great man is a woman pointing and yelling at him to make unkeepable promises. Wow. Movie completely blows past Ellie dropping her tomboy persona and how this couple managed to stay in love during their awkward high school years and college years based on their mutual respect of Charles Muntz. This is a prime example of when sentimental value goes totally wrong. Instead of buying a house they can actually live in, Carl and Ellie decide to buy the condemned house they met in and spend the first few years of their lives basically rebuilding the entire thing. I can't even imagine what the inspection for this was like, and this house has been abandoned for well over a decade. That's not a fun renovation project, that's a tetanus shack. Ellie and Carl do manual labor in their wedding clothes. The movie takes place in an alternate universe where superhelium exists, but adoption apparently doesn't. Weren't quite ready to explain miscarriages to your children? Well, now you have to. How much change could they possibly have in that jug? $15? And if they fill it up, maybe $30? they will have enough money to check out a documentary about Paradise Falls, but we'll definitely be a few thousand dollars short of actually paying for a trip. Also, when we actually go to Paradise Falls later in the film, we see that it's still completely remote and uninhabited. How do they plan on actually getting there? Are they saving up for their own Zeppelin? Also, Paradise Falls is based on a real place in Venezuela called Canaima National Park, and if we make believe that's the actual Paradise Falls, I bet it would be challenging for them to claim residence in a Venezuelan national park. Goddamn, they did a fantastic job restoring that probably 70-year-old house. Did they reinforce it with steel beams? And then suddenly, without any warning, Pixar sends you into a montage that is both full of sadness and joy and more sadness without a word of dialogue spoken. It's like one of those great Pixar shorts that precede all the full-length features. And I think I just cried a little. It's downright incredible, and we're removing five sins for its brilliance. I believe I made my position to your boss quite clear. You poured prune juice in his gas tank. I find this unlikely. This assumes the boss drives a car that doesn't have one of those spring-loaded gas doors that you'd have to actually break into the car to open. Or the boss just leaves his car unlocked all day at a construction site. Also, this old man who uses a cane somehow managed to get to the car without being seen, carrying a funnel and some prune juice. And sh how did they even figure out it was prune juice? Unless they saw him and let him do it, or Carl told them, or they ran it to a lab. And why didn't the boss press charges? He's out to get your house! John Ratzenberger is acting like this is new information, even though he said earlier, My boss would be happy to take this old place off your hands and- Also, I have a hard time believing whatever faceless corporation is in charge of this project doesn't just pay off whoever and abuse a little eminent domain to steal Carl's house away from him. Russell's persistence leads me to believe he thinks Carl is the only old person in this town. Oh! <laughs> Earlier, we're told that Carl oh, poured prune juice in his gas tank. And that didn't seem to create any issues. But after Carl assaults this worker, he's forced to sell his house and move into an old folks' home. I understand that assault is a worse crime than damage of personal property, but the latter is still a crime, and that seemingly went completely unpunished. These assholes still wear their sunglasses in court, which no so called judge would allow. So, was Carl sentenced by the court to live in a retirement community? Is it a retirement village slash prison? Man, Carl was a terrible balloon salesman. Also, how did he have the time to blow up all these balloons and keep them hidden before the Shady Oaks folks showed up? And are we really expected to believe that Carl isn't physically fit enough to walk down the stairs in his own house, but can climb all over the roof to tie those balloons and set up a steering mechanism? There's no amount of balloons this movie could animate that would convince me balloons could rip a house from its foundation and all its connected utilities. Also, Carl doesn't disconnect the electricity and water before his grand escape. Also, also, if these balloons could rip up a house off its foundation and let it fly away, then how the actual f 
Was Carl able to keep them concealed behind his house until this point? Are the impossibly giant tarps that he has for some reason as dense as neutron stars? Also times three, way to use an increasingly scarce resource to fly your house irresponsibly, you jackass. Even though Carl has yet to engage his steering apparatus, the house manages to avoid all the tall buildings during its ascent. Carl's balloon house is a dick to analog television. Aw, ain't that nice. The airplane billboard features South America prominently in this North American town. You know, because of the story and all. The shower curtains make clever sales and imply that Carl always possessed the knowledge how to fly a house without at least one practice try. Also, numerous military and police would have been called when they heard the reports of a flying house using balloons. But fortunately for Carl, this took place during during Taco Tuesday and no one called or cared. And I followed it under your porch? Oh really? Then where were you when this happened? Not only do I not see any wilderness explorers under Carl's porch, but I also can't see a way to get under the porch in the first place. Whoa, is this how you steer your house? Uh, you'd think, but Carl has done zero steering since he got in the air. And it's totally, absolutely amazing he hasn't checked to see if he needs to dodge aircraft or tall buildings. But if you train these balloons well, they know where to go. See? Cumulonimbus. Wow, good thing Russell is impossibly here, so he could warn Carl about the clouds. If not, Carl would have just been sleeping in his chair when the storm came in and movie over. At least we would have had the montage. Carl's house doesn't completely break apart, nor do enough of the balloons pop in this storm, causing them to fall out of the sky. Whew, I thought you were dead. So I piloted this house all the way to South America anyway. We're in South America, all right. Was Carl asleep for several days, or does the movie want me to believe they were a storm and a nap away from Venezuela? The momentum of this giant house, guided by balloons and being dragged by an elderly person and a child, stops right at the edge of the cliff, just like all the airplanes, tanks, Fast and Furiouses, and Starship Enterprises we've ever seen. You'd think that a 50-ton kite wouldn't allow a kid and an old man to maintain their position, but you'd be wrong. Not only do they drop out of the f***ing sky right on top of the place where Carl and Ellie always wanted to go, but they just so happen to be adjacent to the vista that's painted above their fireplace. The same angle and everything! I came all this way! Just to get stuck at the wrong end of this rock pile? Talk about crotchety. Carl accidentally flies his house hundreds of miles and ends up just a few short miles of where he wants to be and he's still pissed? He should probably just settle and plop his house right here and begin starving to death. At least they could look at the waterfall while they died. After all, we went down. How? Plot convenient physics? How the f*** did they get down here? In the last scene, they were walking along a cliff where there were no trees. But now it looks like they're walking through the thick jungle at the bottom of the cliffs. Did they cut the scene where Russell and Carl decide to take the physically impossible route? Russell, if you don't hurry up, the tigers will eat you. There's no tigers in South America. Zoology! Yeah, so because there aren't tigers per se, let's just stop in the middle of the South American jungle. Because no tigers equals no other kinds of animals that can kill you. Tracks? <gasps> Snipe! Even though Russell still has his zoology badge, he still thinks this pterodactyl-sized footprint was left behind by a snipe. I found the snipe! Oh. I guess it can be forgiven that Russell, as a kid, doesn't know what a snipe looks like, but I'm kind of curious as to why he didn't research what snipes look like, considering that he knew that tiger fact about South America and looks to be a dutiful wilderness explorer. I mean, he should have known they don't exist after the first day. Also, why does this kid even think the snipe came with them on this journey in the first place? Wasn't Russell under and inside the house during this trip to South America? I'm fine with this misidentified snipe for humor and story purposes, just not logic purposes. Mr. Fredrickson is nice! Kevin, a made-up animal that is indigenous to South America, has a keen understanding of the English language. <coughs> yeah, that's totally gross, but then Carl picks it up completely dry within 10 seconds of this happening. Oh hey, now they're back up on top of the cliff! You'd think since they have access to some kind of wormhole, they'd just use it to magically go to the other side of the cliff, instead of just bouncing from the top to the bottom, but here we are. Either Russell's pack is exclusively filled with chocolate bars, or he has some sort of infinite chocolate bar that came from the same factory where they made Mary Poppins' bag. My master made me this collar. He is a good and smart master, and he made me this collar so that I may talk. Squirrel! Well, this is adorable and hilarious. Removing us in. You could that cradle contigo. I use that collar. What does you want, To talk with him. I would be happy if you... Doug's collar is programmed with Spanish, a southern accent, and Japanese. You know, the three main languages. Have you seen a bird? I want to find one, and I've been on the scent. I'm a great tracker. So does this collar give these dogs a basic level of human intelligence, too? Or is this movie suggesting that dogs have the capacity to think just like we do, but are unable to express themselves because they don't have human vocal cords? Also, if I put this collar on a cow or a chicken, would they be able to speak in the same way? Would that mean that all animals are secretly just as intelligent as we are, but are unable to express themselves? I just became a vegan. Coming back. Charles Muntz was able to invent talking dog collars and video chat using technology from the 1940s. The bird is my prisoner now. 
Wow. Where the f*** is this camera located? I just saw Doug a few minutes ago, but I don't remember seeing a camera on top of his head, which is what this current shot would suggest. Why is he with that small mailman? A dog that's lived in jungle isolation with his other dog pals and one other human for his entire life is aware that mailmen exist. The house and the hose that connects them to it aren't constantly getting caught in tree branches. And this wouldn't even be a sin if they just stayed on top of the cliff where there are no trees. But instead, they keep reappearing in this dense jungle they shouldn't have access to. I think that did the trick. Hi, Master. Yep, I'm gonna sin the old pastime of a cartoon character and possibly transporting ahead of the other characters. It's what we do, unfortunately. Whoever gave Russell the tent building patch that I'm sure he has will hopefully be disbarred from the Wilderness Explorer community. There must be something in the South American air that allowed Russell's face to heal so quickly. Cross your heart. Carl's surprised that Russell says this, like it was something he and Ellie made up on their own, and not something that people have said for decades. What is it doing? The bird is calling to her babies. How do you know that? Just because you're a dog doesn't mean you speak fluent bird. And hell, earlier you said you didn't even know what a bird looked like, so I deride your bird understanding abilities. Where's the bird? You said you had the bird. You saw this bird on this little video phone thingamajig, right? Who cares about what he said? Muntz has been able to maintain a dog army for the past 70 years or so with presumably very little food and no female dogs. Are you Charles Muntz? Yes. If he's actually Charles Muntz, that would mean that he's at least 15 to 20 years older than Carl. I imagine Carl is in his late 70s, which would put Charles well into his 90s. Which isn't impossible, but I imagine it would be hard to maintain your health with just a bunch of dogs, a finite amount of food, and no doctors. I mean, he's never even had a prostate exam. Muntz found a cave large enough to fit his blimp. Put him in the cone of shame. What do they tell the dogs that need to have operations when they have to wear this cone? Is it still the cone of shame? Why not have a crate of shame? I found it on safari with uh, Roosevelt. If he means FDR time-wise, that would make sense, but I'm having trouble visualizing him on safari with the president who was famously in a wheelchair. If not him, then the only other famous Roosevelt would be Theodore Roosevelt. Given Theo's interest in big game hunting, it makes sense that he would be referring to him. But given that he died in 1919, when Muntz was either not born or a small child, that really f***s up the timeline. Epsilon is the finest chef I've ever had. The dog? How does he do anything? Either that's a 70-year-old frozen hot dog, or he's making his own hot dogs out of the local squirrels. There's also the dog army. Russell's been eating chocolate for two days and somehow refrains from inhaling this hot dog before this asshole has enough time to take it off his plate. More often I get thieves come to steal what's rightfully mine. You do? You mean there are actual people out there making trips to remote parts of South America to steal your sh**? Oh, I've spent a lifetime tracking it. And Carl and Russell ran into it within minutes of arriving at Paradise Falls. But it ran off. It's gone now. Carl lies to Muntz for Kevin, even though he's made it clear several times that he doesn't care for the bird. And he knows Muntz won't kill him because in order to be vindicated, he has to return with the bird a lot. Carl should know that if he's just honest about the Kevin, Muntz won't harm him or Russell. If anything, he's just putting Russell and himself in serious danger. Also, human children are more important than birds. Why am I forced to explain this to Pixar? We haven't even had dessert yet. None of you have even had dinner yet. The old man and the out of shape child are able to outrun a pack of dogs. The house survives this. Doug uses his super strength to push these boulders down to block the pack of dogs. Now Russell survives this. Dog helm scream. So they decided to get Kevin back to her home, but they decided to lug the house with them? But why? Couldn't you just tie this thing somewhere? Then you wouldn't have to haul it back either. It is funny because the squirrel gets dead. All the dogs have an extreme hatred for squirrels, yet we haven't seen a single squirrel since we've been in Paradise Falls. At least not since months got the hot dog machine up and running. Not only have the balloons stayed inflated for two to three days now, but they continue to not get popped by branches. The wilderness isn't quite what I expected. Kinda wild. Haha, -ha, funny joke, but this jungle's been anything but wild since they got here. They ran into one rare bird and a bunch of trained dogs, not in their natural habitat, and nothing else. Even with all their treacherous detours, they still made it to the fall side of the cliff, just as the balloons ran out of lift. On some of these pictures Carl flips through in Ellie's scrapbook, I can honestly say, where is camera? You're telling me they set up a delay on a camera and got these candid shots? Or did they have a photographer constantly following them around? If they'd trimmed the professional photographer budget, they probably could have eked out a trip to Paradise Falls. Upon further examination of Ellie's chair, I deem it unsuitable. An old man who needs a machine to go down the stairs is able to throw all his furniture out the front door. Doug the dog knows how to knock. I was hiding under your porch. Is there some sort of magical alcove under Carl's porch that allows dogs and children to hide down there and then move onto the porch while the house is in the air? Russell has Superman flight powers with a leaf blower where he's able to will himself forward, even though the leaf blower only blows at one speed. Also, how does he keep from continuing to float upward? Well, if you're here, Fredrickson can't be far behind. Yeah, because you totally figured out that he found a way to make his house fly again, even though he's been hauling it around for the last couple days. Carl slings a hose and gets the sprayer to grab onto the cargo door on the first try. Then he ziplines down it like it's second nature. How do 
when we get past these dogs. How do they not smell your prune and denture cream scent? Or the other dog. The dogs can cook a gourmet meal and tie a human boy to a chair, but still need a chew toy to fire a gun on a biplane. Okay, I've been pretty forgiving of Carl's super old person abilities, but I'm gonna have to draw the line at climbing an upside down ladder and almost falling off but catching himself. I hate squirrels! The movie continues its needless assault on squirrels. Also, the dogs never get picked up after this battle is over, so I can only assume they live the rest of their lives starving in the Venezuelan jungle. I don't know too much about dirigibles, but I would imagine having a house on the back would screw with the balance and create an issue. Also, it looks like Carl, the normal old man, is able to stop the house from sliding off the back of it. I put more faith in the house ripping Carl's arms off before I believe any of the shit I'm seeing right now. Bad guy falling to his death because showing him die any other way would be too gruesome for a kids movie cliche. Nice transition, but allow me to be a dick for a moment, because that means they would have had to be in the exact same position and do the exact same things twice for this to be possible. Yep, I'm a dick. You know what? Keep him. Yeah, he clearly doesn't need a cane. Did you see all the shit he pulled in the last scene? We'll graduate to Senior Explorers. Why do all these kids get to graduate to Senior Explorer? They don't have all the badges. Man, Russell's mom was super okay with her son being gone for three or four days, and continuing to let Russell see the man the courts say is a menace to society, and is responsible for her kid being gone in the first place. I wonder how much trouble Carl will get in with the FAA for parking an unlicensed 60-year-old airship above an ice cream store. You mean to tell me the house landed right f off? Forget it. These end credits are some more where is camera nonsense. Humility before nature that's being displayed here um, staggers me. Believe me, just wait till they get a look at you. Wait till they get a load of me. What kind of dining set defines me as a person? All wings report in. Red 10 standing by. Red 7 standing by.